was. Thank you. Oh, perfect. I was sharing with Congressman Lewis on our way over. Um, I said, Congressman, do you know, uh, did you ever know Vivian Malone? And for those, those of you that don't know Vivian Malone, I went to the University of Alabama, and I was fortunate to finish my doctorate at the University of Alabama. And when I finished, I took myself and my family members uh, to stand in the schoolhouse door. And those of you that know the story and the history behind that, uh, Vivian Malone is very significant. And so naturally, the congressman said, not only do I know her, you know, we work very closely together. And so it's just I'm in awe to be able to have someone of his stature here uh, with us at Texas Southern University. So on behalf of all the faculty and the staff and the students that are in the room from Texas Southern University, uh, we really uh, want to thank again the congressman and the congresswoman uh, for being here. And so on that note, I'd like to introduce our dean of the school of Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs, Dr. Michael Adams. Thank you, President Lane. Good morning, and I really appreciate your indulgence and your patience uh, because what a wonderful occasion. Uh, John Lewis is someone who is not only an icon in the civil rights movement, but he touched my life very closely as a graduate of Tougaloo College and also a graduate of Atlanta University. I followed the career of John Lewis. Uh, certainly, when I think of John Lewis, I think of Mississippi Freedom Summer. And I cannot think of anyone other than Fannie Lou Hamer who has endured more in the struggle for civil rights than the Honorable John Lewis. So on that note, and in the interest of time, I would like to say thank you for Congresswoman Jackson Lee for bringing the Honorable John Lewis to the School of Public Affairs. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and to this great institution, I think John and I are used to standing up. <laughs> so um, thank you so very much for welcoming us. Thank you to President Lane. Thank you to Dean Adams. This university has been nothing but generous in the tradition of your fight, of your struggle, uh, and your historic presence in American society. You are the core conscience of all that has been good and paving the way for those who cannot speak for themselves. And so, go ahead, Dr. Lane, you need to leave that fight for sure. Uh, so as I acknowledge Dean Adams, where are you? Thank you for uh, being the uh, definer, uh, if you will, of what this school means. There's no doubt Barbara Jordan, the policy leader, Mickey Leland, the implementator, speaking to the hearts and minds of those who cannot speak for themselves. I am privileged to represent you in the United States Congress. Thank you for your leadership. Let me acknowledge uh, the representative and district manager for the Honorable Al Green, who was with us last evening, a graduate of Texas Southern University and a dear friend. Let me also acknowledge Congressman Gene Green, who's been so supportive of this effort, and thank him for his leadership. I want to thank Linda Brown, who's been working with us uh, for her efforts, and all of my staff. Uh, and let me thank Lawrence Snowden, uh, who had his beginnings at this school, has been elevated, but and when I say this school, the public affairs school, has been elevated and been a distinguished uh, contributed to this effort, Lorenz Snowden. Give him a very big hand. Uh, we have uh, many of our press here. We thank you so very much. Uh, there will be a press conference following. Uh, there are distinguished pastors here. I would ask for the pastors to stand, please, if you would, to give them a very big hand. Uh, and I'll single out one, know that you pastors don't mind, uh, that we single out John uh, one, Reverend Dr. William A. Lawson, who, <laughs> somebody wanted to say the word Pope, I don't want to get in trouble, Reverend Dr. William A. Lawson, who was the only pastor uh, that extended his hand 
uh, when uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King can, came and uh, was had the privilege of being tear gassed and uh, had the un uh, unlikely privilege of being tear gassed and uh, was a leader of this campus and has been our leader ever since. We're so grateful for his presence. Reverend Dr. William A. Lawson. I want to acknowledge the provost, Provost Wilson. I want to acknowledge a long-standing icon of this school, Dr. Bobby Mills, who had his own session just a few days ago, opening it up. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, all of you, uh, if I might. We're here for a serious moment. And we were in a session before uh, where questions were being raised about violence, about violence against each other, about the enormity of gun violence that has taken over, to some extent, uh, unfortunately, uh, the lives of many Americans. And in my statement, it means that they have suffered at the hands of gun violence. Reminded of Bishop Dixon, who buried, I think, a few weeks or so ago, uh, individuals who fell victim to gun violence. Reminded of July 4th, celebratory time, two and three and four folk were shot and suffered gun violence. And so this is a serious question that we in Houston have to ask, we in Texas have to ask, and we in this nation have to ask. Who are we as a people? I'm grateful that the Dean of the State Legislature is here, please stand, who's been a leader on human rights, a leader on anti-gun violence and the protection of women, the Honorable Representative Sophronia Thompson. <laughs> Member of our school board, Jolanda Jones is here, trustee, HISD. <laughs> Not sure if any other elected officials are in the room. Uh, we are so uh, grateful for uh, their service. So I'm going to yield to John. We'll have a few statistics. Um, I want to read a letter from the Honorable Congresswoman Giffords, who was gunned down on a corner uh, in her hometown, reaching out as a member of Congress, as we do, and in the loss or in the violence of that act, a judge was killed, a federal judge and a little girl. And she was permanently injured, but she has never given up. Just one week after the historic sit-in in the House, on the House floor, tomorrow leaders in Congress will hold yet another historic event to urge our elected officials in the U.S. House of Representatives to hold a vote on bipartisan legislation that protects the rights of law-abiding Americans, keeps guns out of the wrong hands, and saves lives. She is the co-founder of the Gun Violence Prevention Organization, Americans for Responsible Solutions. In it, she said she wanted to thank Congresswoman Jackson Lee for helping to lead the fight against our nation's gun violence crisis, and for John Lewis being the visionary, the very visionary of this nonviolent movement. Speaking, she said, is difficult for me, but I haven't been silenced, and neither should the American people. Their representatives must vote to make our communities safer. Gabrielle Giffords. With that, I want to turn the microphone to this man of peace, this man of great conscience, uh, who has been brought to tears in his life when America's fail to rise to our higher angels. And that is the iconic civil rights leader, civil rights advocate, your brother, John R. Lewis, congressman from Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're here at a great, great university. I want to thank President Lane. Thank you, Mr. President. Dean Adam. 
To all of the honorable elected officials, see some of my brothers there, the blue ties, white shirt. I got to acknowledge them, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Reverend Dr. Lawson, and to all of the religious leaders, and thank all of the students, young people, the moms for being here. With your red on. Thank you. I want to thank my beloved sister, <laughs> my friend, and my colleague, your congressperson, Sheila Jackson Lee. <laughs> As I said to some earlier, you're more than lucky. You're blessed to have this one wonderful young woman represent you in the Congress. She, she has more energy. Sometimes it's, I think I have a lot of energy. And I'm much older than she is. But sometimes you know, it's hard to keep up with her. She's here one day, she's someplace, she's on the move. So we have to keep moving, right? Working with you, John. I have to keep moving. On the issue of gun violence, I've said on the House floor of the Congress a few weeks ago there's just too much violence in our country. Too many killings of our children, our mothers, our fathers, our sisters and brothers, our students. When we saw what happened in Connecticut, an elementary school, with these little kids, these little babies being murdered, and those of us in the Congress didn't have the raw courage to pass comprehensive gun legislation. It is a shame. It is a disgrace. We have to stop it. And that's why some of us came together. And on our side of the aisle, every single Democratic member of the House took part in that sit-in on the floor. Never in the history of the Congress. Never. But you had a group of members to come in and just take a seat. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In the well of the house. Yes, sir. Right. We brought it to a standstill. Right. And sometimes when you see that something is not right, not fair, not just, you have to stand up and say something and do something. And sometimes you do it by sitting down right. or sitting in. And we have to stop it. It cannot continue. We're not trying to take people guns away. We believe in the Second Amendment. I grew up in a house in rural Alabama where my father had a rifle over the door and a shotgun in a corner and he told us never to touch it. Don't even look at it. And we didn't. There are forces in our country trying to make the people believe that we're trying to take away people guns. But as some people shouldn't have guns. People who go around abusing members of the family, people who have mental health problems, shouldn't have guns. That's what it's all about. Yes, sir, John. We're, we're here to listen to the moms, to family members, to tell your story. Yes. And we want to go back to Washington and do something about it when we convene. We got to stop it. We got to respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. We have to do it. So I think, Congresswoman, we, we're here to listen, right? So we're going to listen. She's talking. <laughs> got to help myself up. When I was sitting down on the floor, I, I said, I'm going to sit here you sure did. My, for a few hours. And some of you may have to help me get up. The, pres the, pre the, pre the president was willing to help me get up. But uh, we want to listen to the people. And we want to go back armed 
with faith and hope and stick-to-itness to do something about it. Okay? I do want to acknowledge Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, guys. Uh, just uh, stand up. Uh, welcome, John, there. Thank you so very much. My husband's a Sigma, so we're all in this together. Uh, and uh, I want to just show one board, and then you're going to hear from these mothers, John, uh, just so you can hold that with me, John. And we're just going to read it out. We'll come out, we'll come out this way. John is right. We're not trying to take away anybody's guns. This is some of the deadly mass shootings. Why we, we could not, not come here to Texas Southern University, a place where policy is understood, to say to America and to Houston, we've got to do something. There are too many guns in the hands of individuals who would do us harm. Orlando, 50 killed, 53 injured. Those injuries will last for some of these people for a lifetime. In Blacksburg, Virginia, 2007, 32. That was Virginia Tech, 32 killed, 17 injured. Newtown, with these children, I thought we would never have to ask the question about gun safety again. 27 dead, one injured. Colleen, Texas, 22 dead. 20 injured, San Bernardino, San uh, Yucita, California, 1984, 21 dead, uh, and 19 injured, San Bernardino, 14 dead, 21 injured, Edmond, Oklahoma, 14 dead, and 6 injured, Fort Hood, Texas, we all, 13 dead of our soldiers and civilians, 6 injured, New York, 13 dead, 4 injured, and Aurora, Colorado, 12 killed and 58 injured, all with guns. And so you're going to hear from these mothers. John and I are going to listen, uh, and then uh, we're going to uh, be able to conclude uh, for us to be able to have a message going forward for what should be our challenge to come together and to bring solution or relief to those aching families who are continuing to suffer. Thank you, Fran Watson, uh, with the LGBT. We're so glad of your presence. Uh, thank you, former council member, Mayor Pro Tem Gonzalez, and thank you for your desire to be in law enforcement uh, and to be involved as our next sheriff to work with us on ending this terrible siege of gun violence. Uh, may we now listen to the mothers and let me provide them, thank you, uh, with their mic. We'll start right over here. Thank you. My name is Calandrian Simpson Kemp, and excuse me because I am, as she say, suffering, and I'm shaky because this is my 20-year-old son, George. My son was murdered three years ago by gun violence. My son was shot in the back of the head, killed him instantly. It was shot four more times. Well, and currently, turn to John. Let's... currently, I'm under his murder trials. It's been taking three years. But I'm devastated. I'm devastated to know that my child resides now in a 10-foot grave because somebody made the choice to purchase some guns and I know they were illegal that encountered my child, my good son that was cutting the elderly grass in his community, the good son that was going to college, that was making something out of his life, that listened to his mom and dad every day, the church going boy, the trail rider, the country boy, mm. the football player, mm. the all-American kid that helped his fellow man out in football get a scholarship and he didn't get anything. But instead, George took it upon himself to put his videos together so he can continue for his education. But the guns, where in the hell did they come from? 
I felt like as a mother that I failed. Like, I didn't tell him. I didn't know that we had a problem like this. I sat him down and we watched Chicago, Detroit, and I always said, son, be on the lookout. But I had no idea that a gun would meet my child here. No idea. And this is devastating. Every day you get up, I had just simplicity just to go to the restroom. I have to t constantly look and turn. There's his bedroom. It's empty. It's empty. Yesterday, I was a nervous wreck. I did, mind just gone. I'm like, God, but how am I going to live without this boy? What am I going to do? But, you know, many days I laid at that grave and cried. I felt him saying, Mama, there's nothing you can do here. You got to get up and go fight. So I'm standing today to fight on behalf of George and all the other little Georges that are out there to say that this is wrong. And I'm so empowered to be connected with Moms and Man Action because, yes, I did start the group, The Village of Mothers in Houston, because I traveled all around with Sabrina Fulton and everybody else. But I said, Houston, we have a problem. Houston is too quiet. So I decided, let me help galvanize mothers through this village just to give them some support to say, you're not going to kill yourself. You're going to make it. You're going to live to, you're going to live through this. But now I can love on you, but being connected with Moms Demand Action, now we have a platform to be able to turn this pain into action, to change these gun laws. And so I'm empowered today. And I thank you guys for being here because it gives me strength to say I can fly and I can keep making it. And when you sat down and when you sat down, good God Almighty. I sat at home and I just say, Jesus, how could they do that? But I said, thank you for sitting down for George Kemp. Because when you sat down, it says, stand up, Calandra. It says, stand up. And I appreciate that for what you guys done for us. God bless you. I make no apologies for the tears that I shed. So it's been 20 year, 10 years, it's only been 10 years. It seemed like it was yesterday. And I wanted to get this photo of Patrick Charles Murphy so you can see the young man that would have been a graduate of Texas Southern University that had his transcripts in the car, sealed transcripts, enrolling in Texas Southern University, that had ambition, that was in the drill team, that was in the church choir. I was a single parent, and there's two people that Patrick Charles Murphy was afraid of, and that was God and Kathy Bluford Daniels. <laughs> because I believed I had five brothers that had been in and out of the penitentiary, and I was determined that my children were not going to take that route. Some say I made him soft, some say I, he wasn't hard enough, but I know it was important to me that he not be a statistic. So to get a knock at the door at 9.30 at night for the neighborhood store and someone say, Miss Kathy, something's happened to Patrick. I said, oh God, Jesus in heaven, it couldn't be Patrick. Patrick, who had just got back from the National Bible Convention, who was so proud of their first place winning in the drill team. Patrick that marched continuously practicing with the drill team. So when I got that knock at the door, I said, oh, God in heaven, it couldn't be Patrick. I said, and as I drove to the store, I saw his car as affirmation. This was not 2 o'clock in the morning. This was a neighborhood store. Someone walked up behind him as he was getting back in his car to come back home four blocks from the house and shot him in the back of the head. You'll never know, and we don't want you to know, what it feels like, because if you close your eyes right now, if you have children, close your eyes right now. Just close your eyes and imagine someone telling you your child is dead. Your heart won't let your brain go there. You can stop it immediately. But as Calendra say, every day I walk by his room. I walk by his pictures. I walk by and see his awards, his trophies, things that he was most proud of. And let me tell you, it just doesn't break up the immediate family. It breaks up the entire family. Because of, I'm from a family of nine, and after Patrick was killed, people went different ways. Mm. We scattered. It's like it tore us apart. We were shattered 
Everybody has remorse about why they're left behind. Everybody points fingers. Well, Kathy, you shouldn't have let him go to the store at 9.15 at night. Mm. Yes, I should have. He had a right to go anywhere he wanted to. But because of people with guns out in the streets mad about some beef because the fight had happened early in the day at 5 o'clock in the evening at that store mm-hmm. in which the young man that killed Patrick was involved in. Patrick had no way of knowing. This man didn't know Patrick, and Patrick didn't know this man. But yet and still, I visit the cemetery five, six, seven times a year, freshening up his flowers. But there's a void at the table every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, every birthday, every holiday. When my family gathers, there's always one missing. Patrick Charles Murphy. And as you sit around and enjoy your families, think about us. Because we'll carry this grief for the rest of our lives. We say it's a, it's a, we have a group called Black Moms. I support Moms Demand Action. I support the Village of Mothers. But we don't want you all to be a part of this group. We don't want any more members. If you see something and somebody with guns illegally, say something. I stopped a 14-year-old kid from La- walking home down Liberty Road from Lamar Fleming that was flashing his gun in his waistband. You say, how do I have the nerve to do that and he's got a gun? Well, like Rep. Lewis, uh, uh, Congressman, I don't feel no ways tied. God protects me when I'm trying to do the right thing. I've already lost one of the most. And I asked myself, God, why me? He said, why not? Why not? So I am fulfilling my mission to be out and try to make statements and let people know, put the guns down. All this senseless violence that's affecting all these families. When you see your child stretched out in a coffin in the church house and you're on the front row and you're constantly looking at his face, when you go to the funeral home and you see the wire cut, everybody know what the wire cut is? That's when they cut you and take out all your organs. And you see your child that you birthed laying there in those conditions. As I was taking a shower one day, and I'll finish, I realized as much as I loved my baby, and I prayed hard for my son. My kids are 10 years apart. My daughter's 10 years older than he is. I realized, I said, Lord, I wanted to see this child. I wanted to make his life wonderful. I wanted him to be a good person in life. Now I realize Patrick was safest when he was in my belly. That's unfortunate. But as I look at it and I think about it, when he was inside me, as I rubbed that belly, that's when I could protect him. That's when I was safest. Thank you all for being out here and supporting us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tar Nicholas. My son was DeAndre Edwards. He was 28 when he was gone down. My story is still fresh. My son was killed this year back in February mm-hmm. on a basketball court behind an argument. Oh. Then when they got to fighting, the child, the young man pulled out the gun and shot my son as my son turned around, shot him in his back. I got the call to get to Ben Tall. My son was in surgery. I was praying all the way down there, God, please let my baby live. Please let my baby live. I got there. My baby son was there. And he said, Mama, he was talking. So I'm saying, okay, God, I know you're going to answer my prayer. Y'all know you're going to answer my prayer. 20 minutes into us being there, I see the surgeon come out first. Then I see the policeman come out. And my heart just broke because I work in the hospital, I work in the OR, so I know what it means when they are coming out to take you to a room. They either gonna tell you they got 50-50 or they not gonna make it. As I walked in that room, I say, okay, God, I'm ready to let them know what 
happened to my baby? Is he going to make it? Do I have to stop work to take care of him? And all of the doctor's mom came. He did not make it. When that happened, tears flooded my eyes. But I had to stand up straight because my other three children started tearing up the whole room because they have lost their brother. And something in me say, stand up, because now I have to take charge for my other children. Because I have two other sons that was contemplating to go do what to the young man what he had done to my son. So I fell on my knees. I said, God, please, I'm faith walker. I'm believing in you, God. I'm trusting in you. I don't want my sons to turn like this young man. Give me strength. But all the time, I always say, I forgive you. Because if I can't forgive the man who killed my son, God won't forgive me. I have to have strength every day to get up out of my bed. Every day. And it, people do not know when you take a loved one like that, the emotions that we go through, the depression sets in, the grief is so unbearable that you have to start thinking about the mental issues that comes into play with us. Every day, I never took medicine, but I had to go to the doctor because now I have anxiety attacks. So I'm on like three or four pills a day just to keep me going. And one day I didn't take, I said, God, I'm not going to take this because every time I have a memory of my son, don't mean that I have to take medicine to get over thinking about my son. So I didn't cut down the medicine. And I'm trusting in God. But I would never think that my son be, could be killed in the area that he grew up right here in Third Ward. Third Ward, where I grew up at, a product of Jack Yates. My son grew up here. My other children grew up here. All products, where we moved, they went to Elkins. But they were products of Third Ward. And I'm just here because guns. And you're right. We don't want to take their guns away. Because my dad had a gun. He's a hunter. But we knew not to touch that gun. But to be told that your child was taken away behind a simple argument that where you could have squashed it and made another day, let him live another day. You took away three boys' father. You took away someone's uncle. You took away someone's cousins. You took away someone's nephew. But most of all, you took away a piece of my heart because he was my son. And like they say, we don't wish this pain on no one. This pain is so unbearable, I'd rather have labor pains. And labor pains ain't nothing <laughs> to play with. But I'm here. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that y'all working for us on this gun safety, the Mothers of Moms on Demand action. I'm happy to be a part of that, along with the Village of Mothers, and meeting great people. And we just here to say that thank y'all. Thank y'all for listening to our stories, to know that this has to, something has to be placed that people with no license or no ID could get guns and pick it up. You go to nursing school, Four years to get a license. Yes. If I don't renew my license, guess what? I can't work. So how is it that they get to put their hands on guns and there's nothing being done and we're studying losing our youth? My grandson is 10. He said, Grandma, I don't want to go to third ward because I don't want to be killed like my Uncle D. And I said, baby, as long as you got Jesus, as long as you got the Lord, the Lord will guide you and protect you. Grandma can't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but always keep him first. And that's what I'm doing. And I thank you for coming down and listening to our story. Congressman John Lewis and Congresswoman John, Sheila Jackson Lee, I will turn it over because I don't want to cry. Because it's hard. It's hard every day. Tears fall every day, every day. I wake up in the middle of the night crying. I go to sleep at 1 o'clock and wake back up at 4 since my son been killed. 
because I was woke up out of my sleep to tell me my son had been shot. So I'm scared that you must have a full night rest. Just thinking about that. So thank each and every one of y'all for inviting us here. And I'll turn it over now to our moms on demand. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, it's hard to follow this <clears throat> and the incredible stories we've heard here, the sad, the tragedy. Uh, I am representing Moms Demand Action. My name is Michelle Still. I do not have a personal story to share, but want to say thank you to Congresswoman Lee and Congressman Lewis for inviting us to this and to thank you for being brave voices in Congress for so long to say enough is enough and we're not going to keep up with the status quo and uh, really thank you all. What you did with the sit-in uh, said to all Americans, this is an urgent, this is a public health epidemic and we cannot sit back and continue to have 33,000 people die every year from gun violence and 100,000 injured from gun violence and lives change forever. So thank you all for doing what you do. This is a bipartisan issue. This is Republicans, this is Democrats. 80% of Americans want sensible gun legislation and it's time for Congress to act on it, to listen to the people and act on it. Uh, Moms Demand Action, for all of you who don't know about us, we're not just moms. We invite everyone. The only requirement is that you have or had a mom. So join us. We want to close um, the loopholes that get guns in the hands of dangerous people, of domestic abusers, of terrorists, of felons. We want to universal background checks that have been shown in states that have comprehensive background checks. Fewer people die from gun violence. We can do this. Most Americans want it. There's no reason. We need you all to stand up and say to the gun lobby, enough is enough. Your control on Congress is coming to an end. Americans want this. We are going to have this. We are starting a gun sense voter pledge. If you come find us after, sign up. And we can send the message that the NRA and the gun lobby does not dictate what happens. And we can keep Americans safe. And when we have <clears throat> leaders like Sheila Jackson Lee and John Lewis, we will see the numbers go down. We will keep our children safe and we won't have to stand here and listen to these stories and these mothers who have lost their children and are devastated. So thank you all so much and please come find us if you want to get involved. We need you. We can do this. Thank you to each and every one of you. As I looked in the audience, I saw many eyes that were brimming with tears. And it causes me to say as I allow uh, one or two questions, and I believe Ms. Brown will announce that we will have a press conference on this issue, we ask the mothers to all join us. But it speaks loudly to the fact that we are not speaking of an issue that is unimportant. And what John and I heard in the United States Congress by those who just could not listen was all of these excuses, it's only a few people if they just had a gun, they could have kept from being killed, like the students at Columbine, or the students at Newtown, or the people in that Orlando club, they just had a gun. And so it's gonna take the American people. And when John led us to that floor, and I think I'm gonna feel compelled for John and I to sit down just one more time but I'm gonna to yield to him and then I'm going to take one or two questions that John will respond to. But there are enough mothers here that are hurting and we had so many others, there may be someone in this room that we could have heard from that's sitting in the audience 
you can't tell me this is not a problem if you can go to any church, any school, any restaurant, and probably get someone to raise their hand that has experienced gun violence in their life. That's not America. And I'm so privileged and honored to be sitting with John Lewis, who some would say, John, you're in the Civil Rights Movement. That's what they told Dr. King when he talked about the Vietnam War. Dr. King, you're a civil rights leader. But John just said one simple thing, what he said to you, sometimes you've got to sit down to be able to get up. John, you want to respond to these mothers? Thank you. Thank you very much, my friend. I want to thank the mothers, each and every one of you, for your willingness to stand up, to speak up, to express your feeling about the loss of your loved one. Um, and you're so right that this is an issue that is a bipartisan issue. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, whether you're a mother or father, a sister or brother, it affects all of us every single one of us. The morning before going to the Capitol, I um, watched what happened in Connecticut, and I literally couldn't get up and walk out the door. It made me cry. Something is wrong and sick in a society, and we have to find a way to do something about it. Now, during the height of the civil rights movement, we didn't have the technology and the ways to communicate like you have today. It doesn't make sense for us to be slaves to an organization like the NRA, when more than 80% of the American people want us to do something. And we have to say to our elected officials, to members of Congress, do something. Stop the killing. In my own city of Atlanta, in my own district, I've gone to too many funerals of little children. Enough is enough. The time is out. And we have to ask candidates, where do you stand? What is your position? So thank you. We're going to go back to Washington, and we're going to fight. We're going to stand up. Maybe again by sitting down. Maybe by getting in the way and making a little noise. So I said to you, don't give up. Don't give in. Keep the faith. Help us on the way. One or two questions that we see a hand. Yes, sir. Uh, introduce yourself. Talk loud because I don't know whether we have a, a roving mic. My name is Jay Wilson, and I'm a Texas Southern University Young Defense Affiliate Council Member. Thank you. Uh, my question for you today, Congressman and Congresswoman, is as we've seen, this isn't a recent issue. This hasn't happened today. So, with years right. and years in office, how have you seen the issue evolve in regards to the polarization uh, of the gun lobbies and uh, the Democratic well, over, over the years, now, to be very frank, uh, brother, and candid with you, there's too many elected officials at the state level, at the national level, too many members of Congress in the body that we serve in feel like they, they must follow, follow the mandate of the gun lobby. Some people, that, they're f folks making a lot of money off of selling guns, stealing guns, and then selling guns at the expense of our loved ones. We have to stop it. We got to get more citizens to, to say it's not right, that it's wrong, and we're going to vote people out of office that fail 
to do something about gone. Okay, this young man over here, and I see you too, and I got a young lady in the red shirt. And that's... Yeah. And then you're, you're, you're loud. Say you're from Texas Southern University if you are, and you got to bellow your voice out, brother. Yes, I'm from Texas Southern University. And uh, part of the reason why NRA has such a strong hold is because of my money and politics. So how does that affect, and what do you believe we should do about money and politics being able to influence our congressmen to have these issues not being taken care of? First of all, there's too much money in politics. Just too much money. I, I, in my case, I do not receive one dime, not one penny, from the NRA. And many of the members that I know are not friends of the NRA. We're friends of the American people, of the mothers, the fathers, our sisters and brothers, our children. Let me, I, I just, I believe in public finance. I've joined with uh, Brother Lewis, and he does as well, on uh, not a dime from the NRA. In fact, we are probably uh, received our lowest grade we've ever received was an F. Yeah, from the NRA. I don't believe, as I said on the floor of the House, that we live in the United States of the NRA. I have nothing against their existence. They are free to be in this country. They're free to advocate for gun owners. I have no opposition to that. But what I do have is the unbelievable hold that they have on the system of democracy. That if the people of this country speak, I need to act. And they've asked me to pass sensible gun legislation and I am being hogtied because of an organization that has lost its way. So I'm looking forward to us working together, all of us, uh, to make a better way. This young lady here with the red shirt. Didn't you have your hand up? Yeah. My name is Ebony Greenfield. Um, I'm a junior at Texas Southern. I guess my question is, um, is there any way where we can put some type of law in order saying that before you can get a gun, you need to pass some type of mental evaluation? The reason I say that is because my brother Khalil in Jackson, Mississippi, was shot and killed at 20 years old by his uncle at a gas station over in Arkansas. And now everybody is saying, oh, he was crazy. You know, something was wrong with him mentally. But he was able to buy a gun. So is there anything we can do to make sure that not only it's harder to get a gun, but before you can even buy one, you got to pass some type of psychological test so that we won't have crazy people out here arguing with family members over nothing and killing them. Well, my, my friend here is several in the House Judiciary Committee, and there have been a attempt for many years to pass legislation with background checks. But as a member of Congress from the state of Virginia, and a lot of the guns come out of the Deep South, they come out of Virginia, out of Alabama, my native state, out of Georgia, in other places, and, and people get guns. Sometimes at gun shows, people buy guns out, out of trunk or cars and trucks. And we need background checks. The American people, even members of the NRA, it's their leaders are supporting that we do something about it. But it's their leaders that are saying no, no. So it, it would take the American people, the voters, to say to members of Congress, to the House, to the Senate, do something. Thank you. 
I agree with your sister. I agree with you 100 percent. On one occasion, I was campaigning in a certain part of my city of Atlanta, and local police officers said to me uh, when I was on the Atlanta City Council, running for city council, running for re-election, they said, Councilman Lewis, be careful in this neighborhood, in this community, people more armed than we are. Let me, um, this is a, a very important discussion. Just to your answer, we've introduced legislation, stamped $500 million, a bill that I've introduced to provide mental health treatment, but to provide and insist that data regarding individuals' mental status, not denying them their constitutional right, goes into the FBI database that would then disqualify them from purchasing a gun. If we were to pass the background checks, all of that would be included. Not to discriminate against a person that suffers a mental challenge, but to protect themselves and to protect others, they should not have guns in their hand. Of course, there are people who are completely uh, without a mental health involvement who pick up the gun. But, and that's the excuse people use. If some are not mentally challenged, uh, then uh, the question is, they want to use that as an excuse to do nothing. We cannot just do nothing. We must pass the background checks and then no fly, uh, no buy. So let me um, be the one that really has to conclude this. Let me acknowledge Trustee Carolyn Shabazz, who's been very helpful. Did she step out of the room? Oh, <laughs> thank her so very much for the work. I always get these good supporters that we have. And I, I see Pastor Fields, uh, if you would indulge me because you asked a question before, do you mind or do you, are you dri driven to ask a question right now? Can you just shout it out quickly, and I want Bishop Dixon to say a word, and then we're going to part. I see other, um, if you go uh, to the rally that we have, we may give you a chance to ask something, uh, those hands that were up. I saw some students there whose hands that were up, and um, yes, we will. Thank you. Pastor Fields, thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. My question or my challenge is not only to legislate guns being purchased, but legislation to frame the ownership of existing guns. Okay, we'll, we'll answer that, Bishop. Concluding remarks and then we'll summary of what you said. Sure. This is a very, very, very passionate conversation. First of all, I think we should thank the Congresswoman and the Congressman for being here in Houston at Texas State University and all of us. I believe that all of us are going to have to become an army of peace together. And what I just heard coming from the leader of, of Moms of Man Action, you don't have to be a mom to join which means that every one of us should join to become a part of a collective so that we're not frustrated by ourselves. So I'm, I'm signing up today to be a part of that. I think if everybody in this room, you've got an interest in the conversation, let's consider joining Moms Demand Action so that both of these congresspersons would go back and say, we have an army of people who are part of a collective. So when they speak, they speak for all of us. And then when the sit down happens again, all of us should be sitting down somewhere together at the same time all across the country. And then finally, the opposition to this is not in this room. I think we need to, all, we're amongst friends today. But there are persons who are making laws and making and voting who are not for sensible gun legislation. We need to have a conversation with the people who are in office who are not a part of this coalition. There are people who are not here who need to hear your passion and hear the stories of these women and see all of us standing behind them. And we know who they are, whether they're Democrat or Republican. My issue is this. When are we going to have that conversation with them? And then the gun lobbyists, 
are supported by evangelical Christian leadership. That's right. That's right. So we need to, as black pastors, call meetings with the white evangelical pastors to ask them, would you tell your members who vote in Congress to vote for sensible gun legislation so that our sons and daughters will be safe in our communities? And I want to, every pastor would have that conversation, lift your hand. Yes, because... Oh, uh, come on now. If we're serious about it, because the members in the Texas legislature and in, U in the United, Con United Con Congress who oppose this go to churches across town, and their pastors are supporting the NRA. And that's why they speak at those conventions. We need to go to meet with those pastors and say, your members are voting to make sure guns stay in the neighborhoods of our sons. Issues dealing with uh, issues of police violence. We are introducing legislation. We have not ignored it. We understand it. We know the Tamir Rice's and Walter Scott's, Eric Garner's. We know their families. We know the unnamed and unknown and the Michael Browns. This violence is being done and dealt with because of members of the Congressional Black Caucus with the establishment of a United States Police Working Group and the introduction of the Law Enforcement and Trust and Integrity Act, of which we're dealing with our friends in the police community. We must work together. We must work to change and understand each other and improve those lives. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a large applause to John Lewis, who has led the conscious fight and will continue the conscious fight. And we will continue to stay on the battlefield with these mothers. Mothers demand action. And we will get it done. We will get it done.